Hello, welcome to 80 Days of Writing with yours truly, Alexis Marie Chute, author of Expecting Sunshine and Above a Star. Okay, so today I wanna to talk about bestsellers. Like, I think it's every author's dream to make that bestseller list. And how on earth do you do it? So really, it is a magical art form. So my new book coming out, Above the Star, is a fantasy. And I think that for a lot of people, making it to the bestseller list requires a little bit of magic. Not that it's fantasy, not that it's fiction, that's not my point, but that it requires a little bit of magic. And what I mean by that is there's different ingredients that come together. So I watched a really amazing TEDx talk. It was actually TEDx Oxford, um, and it was this literary agent Johnny Geller. So he did this amazing, really inspiring TEDx talk, Oxford, about what it takes to make a bestseller. And I thought that his points were quite interesting. He didn't have the little magic point. So his, he had five points. The first one is basically that there's a bridge, a bridge between the familiar towards the unfamiliar. So as, a, as a, an a artist and an author, I know a lot about this kind of idea. So it's about comparative titles. That's what it's called in the book world. So book A plus book B equals my new book. Yay. So for example, with Above the Star, I had one amazing reviewer, early reviewer say, it's a, a wrinkle in time meets the princess bride. So that really puts into perspective what um, the story is about. A wrinkle in time, the, the element of youthful exploration, adventure, coming of age. In my book, people come of age even when they're seniors, which is a cool fact. And then A Princess Bride, again, it's adventure, it's love, um, suspense, good versus evil. So bridging, okay. You know, I appreciate that perspective that that is one way that can make a bestseller, but I'm, I'm not quite sold on that. So the second way that um, Johnny Geller said that, you know, what contributes to making a bestseller is voice. This is the voice of the writer, you know, their, their captivating voice. You know when you re read a story and it's like quintessentially that author, that writer's way of speaking and way of, of communicating the world, that is super beautiful. So I do believe that voice is a very strong indicator of what could become a bestseller. But again, I don't think voice alone does it. So the next thing that Johnny Geller talked about was craft. Again, this is something that I feel like is one of those ingredients that goes into a bestseller, it goes into many books, the craft of writing. So this is where the writer sits down and they hone their words, they hone their sentences, the story, and all these things come together. So there's you know, like the plot, the characters, all these things come together with the voice and the craft of writing and the way that you tell a story and the suspense, the plot, the story arc, how a reader can get into the story. But many good books have greatly crafted words. They are great, you know, reads or good stories. They have engaging characters, but yet they're not bestsellers. So I don't know, I, I think that bridge, you know, comparative titles, the voice and the craft, I think those are elements that go into any great story, but I don't know if it, that's what propels it, uh, any book to going onto the bestseller list. Then Johnny, the literary agent, talked about resonance. So how does this book speak to people at this day and age? And I feel like this, is where we're inching closer to what makes up a bestseller. And finally, Johnny Literary Agent, Oxford TED Talks, hit it on the money, where I feel that a book becomes a bestseller. It's the way that it connects to the reader. So all the ingredients come together, it's the magic formula, but really at the end of the day, the, the secret ingredient is the reader. And that is the heart of every story that has hit the bestseller list. It connects with readers. So Johnny Geller, the literary agent, did say that readers and the act of reading is a creative act. 
It's creativity when you pick up a book and you read it. You're being creative. And I really feel that that spark that comes alive when we are invested in a story and we are reading, it's like we as readers join with the author and we are co-creators of this magical world. Yes, the reader paints the pictures so vividly, so vividly we hope uh, with their words that that the reader can fill in the blanks and it is the space between. That's something else that Johnny said. It's the space between the sentences where the reader fills in their own life experience that the story comes to life. I love that. And so today on my 80 days of writing, I am setting out to write book two and three in the Eighth Island Trilogy, book two and three that come after Above the Star. And I think any writer has this in the back of their head. How do I connect with as many readers as possible? How do I become this bestseller? And so for me, I am, my recipe for bestseller success looks a little bit different than Johnny, literary agent, his way of looking at it. So I do believe strongly the voice of the uh, writer needs to come through, that the craft needs to be excellent, that all these different components come together. But I think that there has to be that magic. And so what that looks like for me in my books is trying to tell a story in such a way that it connects with people's desires, the surface desires, which is for adventure and, and love, but also our deeper needs as humans to feel connected to each other, the world around us, to feel that we have purpose and meaning. So to me, I'm bringing, like that's my magic recipe to making a book that I am praying and, and hoping and crossing my fingers and toes that readers will connect with and love. Because I think that at the end of the day, when the spirit, the heart, the mind is moved after reading a story, that's where the bestseller status comes from because you've made a difference, you've changed a life through the creation of this book and as it's gone out into the world. And then the person who read it is gonna go tell their friends. I, I think that in today's day and age, social media is changing and people are feeling this depression from it. I know I feel, you know, you'd get jealous of everybody else's life and you feel down. And even if I haven't even read anything significant, I still always feel this downness after, you know, being especially Facebook and, and Twitter and like things where it's like we get argumentative with strangers and I just I try to remove myself from that but it's made me and I think many people hunger and desire real relationships and real connectivity with other humans face to face and I think that that realness that we hunger and desire for that's what we can find in books and stories they make us think they make us come alive and we invest ourself and our time as readers in a book and when there's that payoff where we feel this level of satisfaction at the end I think that that is a beautiful creative inspiring igniting experience and that is the joy that I want to capture in my books and as for you if you're a writer that's what you want to encapsulate in your books that people leave changed and inspired and thinking differently about the world and about the people in their lives that's beautiful. That is beautiful. And I think that that is what makes a bestseller and that is what it's going to change the world. So today is my 80 days of writing journey. It's day 37 of 80. And I'm inviting some special music, mu I'm inviting some special musicians <laughs> to join me. I really feel like music is almost like a parallel journey to reading a book. You enter into this experience where you don't necessarily know what's coming with the music. You get lost in it. It connects with your your whole body and who you are and and it can be so transformative. So today, I don't have guitars. I don't have drums. I don't have piano. I have a bit more of a unique instrument coming. So one of my great friends, Melissa, she is a French horn player. So we're gonna see her talent. And I am gonna stand off to the side and do my writing and get lost in the process. Melissa's told me this is gonna be loud. I'm forewarning you, French horns apparently are very loud. But I, I, I'm inviting you to join in this journey. 
of me writing, of French horns playing, of the bizarre, beautiful life and world that we live in. And I think that that's what is contagious. Maybe the whole idea of bestseller book, bestselling album for musicians, bestselling anything, is the idea that it's so good that it's contagious. Gosh, I love that. I'm gonna have to write that down. <laughs> write that down as inspiration for myself. So good that it is contagious, that we want to pass it on. Okay, so thank you for being here with me. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would love it. Thank you. Subscribe to my e-news by going to alexismariechute.com slash contact and entering in your email address. I promise I will respect your information and not send you too many notifications. Okay, please join me and have a blissful, amazing day. Hey, welcome to 80 Days of Writing with yours truly, Alexis Marie Chute, and I have some lovely ladies here. I'm going to get them to introduce themselves and just say, so they're going to practice for a minute, but just say like a little bit about the horn. This is the French horn, so I made a mistake calling it a trumpet. It's not a trumpet. Don't do the blasphemy like I did. Okay, take it away, ladies. Um, my name is Melissa Baker. Talk louder. Louder, Melissa. I'm not a very good public speaker. My name is Melissa Baker. And I'm Kimberly Vanderwolf. Yay, and French horn. <laughs> Let's give us one French horn fact before you jump into oh, your practice. I was gonna do the French horn facts later. Sure, okay. I'll do. So, uh, French horn fact. Um, French horn fact, the French horn isn't really French. Um, that's how the English call it. Um, as it's in the key of F, in many other countries, it is not called the French horn. It's totally an English thing. Um, and in some professional circles, it's preferred that it's referred to as just the horn. It's not French. <laughs> so is there an actual other horn or no? Um, well, other people will call their um, brass instruments a horn because they all have a bell of some sort. And you blow um, into it. And you blow into it. Uh, but. The French horn is the only one that is just the horn and doesn't have another name. Gotcha. So we get the horn today. This is special. All right. So you practice, do what you need to do. And I'm just going to be writing and we'll chat throughout. And Melissa's got some other French horn facts. This is kind of exciting. <laughs> said it was good if we if we had the practice time in the video and we were like it's <laughs> <laughs> my fault okay and then do you want to play Fun fact number two, the horn with all of its tubing is almost four feet long. So when we're playing, all the condensation that builds up means that there's a lot of plumbing to clean out. So if you see us pausing to empty out our instruments all the time, <laughs> that's why. <laughs>
out of uh, Mozart's um, 12 duets and there's some discrepancy over who the duets were actually written for. Um, some people say that it may have been written for the, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the basset horn, which is actually a woodwind instrument um, and it's uh, not a very common instrument. I don't think I've ever seen one. Uh, so the first one we played is uh, duet number five, uh, Larghetto. And the next one that we're playing is duet number nine, uh, which is the uh, menuetto. And we're amateur. We have day jobs. <laughs> <laughs> we have lives besides the horn. We divas. don't play the horn all the time, every day, <laughs> like you would if you were a professional player. 
<clears throat> well, thank you for serenading to me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. Duets by Henry Kling. Um, Henry Kling, I don't really remember. I didn't do a bunch of research before coming here. I wasn't expecting this to be like a concert. I just came to play. <laughs> but Henry, Henry Kling was a, um, was a fairly well-known horn player, um, I believe in the 1800s. And he was a composer as well as, um, as, well as a horn player. Uh, so he wrote um, a lot of studies for French horn, and I think that's what these um, duets are meant to be, is um, our uh, studies uh, for horn for duet. Uh, so the first one we um, played was, and I'm not sure how you pronounce it, uh, La Chasse? La Chasse. It means the hunt in French. <laughs> <laughs> she must speak French. Okay, I'll stop asking questions. You do, <laughs> you do your thing. <laughs> Uh, and the next one we'll play is an, another, um, uh, another, Le Chasse, uh, um, the, um, Moderado Le Chasse.
quicker piece. That was number 13. And, and with these studies, they have um, suggested tempos, but uh, with studying, um, a lot of uh, people um, start out at, um, you know, whatever tempo, and then they'll work towards uh, the suggested tempo uh, with, uh, uh, with the selection. I'm inspired to write some music into Uh, and then this is another, um, I'll let you say it. to give some French horn facts. We've just been playing. I missed my entry here. Uh, so another horn fact, uh, fun horn fact, um, is, uh, uh, is modern horns have valves. We have little keys. Uh, they're rotary valves. However, early horns did not have valves. Um, a lot of the horn uh, that was developed for musical groups such as orchestra, um, was developed a lot in Germany, and uh, valves were first introduced by uh, two German inventors in 1814, and they were not very popular in the beginning. A horn without valves is um, uh, is uh, called uh, a natural horn. We have ones with valves. <laughs> Thank you. 
down there. He's nine months old, so I do not have childcare for him. <laughs> Don't worry, someone is with him. He's not left alone crying by himself. Brooke, what if you take him into the basement? There's toys horse down there. Do oh, I should do another horse bath. Yeah. Did you want to go play with toys? Sure the baby? Me. You go take the baby to play um, with your toys. So, uh, um, we, uh, our, um, duets that we were playing with the cling, uh, some of the ones were the, the, the yeah, <laughs> Uh, so that's more of like a hunting horn, um, type, um, piece, uh, and some of the earliest horns, uh, were, that's what they were, were hunting horns, and they didn't include all this extra tubing in the middle, they were just, um, a circular, uh, piece of um, brass or whatever they were made out of. Uh, my horn is also made out of brass. Um, and, uh, and like I said before, uh, those ones didn't contain valves or anything. It wasn't until, um, it wasn't until um, the last 500 years or so maybe, I didn't look into time frames when it was actually developed to be played in um, groups like orchestra. Uh, the horn is categorized as a wind instrument in the brass family. Uh, other brass in instruments include the trumpet, trombone, or tuba. Uh, woodwind instruments are the um, are the other uh, family, and uh, they include instruments like the flute and clarinet. Are they made of wood? Uh, just... Many of them are. Uh, a flute is made out of out of um, out of nickel, silver. I wonder why <laughs> some kind of metal. What is Alloy. the woodwind component? Because they have reeds, or most woodwinds have reeds. Yes, yeah, flute. Yeah. Okay. Flute's kind of the odd one out. I think. <laughs> yeah. Have to get a flute player coming in to talk about the flute. But, yeah. But um, I was gonna say. Yeah. Actually, the horn was like a modern or a very old telephone. So they would go on hunts and they would use <clears throat> the horn is very loud. So they would do specific horn calls to say, oh, we saw a rabbit or a deer. Oh, interesting. And it would let other hunting parties know the animals are on their way to you so you can they can hunt them. Cool. And they would have songs that would like honor the animals that they'd killed like after hmm, the hunt. Too. That's really nice. So should have got Kim to bring her own fun horn back. I love the history of the horn. Oh, really? Oh, you should have been doing it's the horn okay. facts. <laughs> okay, how old were you ladies when you started horn? I started when I was 15, 14? 14. Yeah, okay. I played the violin before, but it wasn't the instrument for me. I sounded like a dying cat. <laughs> so then I started the French horn. Yeah, when I was 14, all my friends were in band. And so I, I was a year behind. So I caught up over the summer and... I just thought it looked really cool and the teacher didn't have a French horn was, and was so excited to have one because she played it as well, Mrs. Thurgood. Uh, and I've stuck with it ever since. I got my own instrument when I was 16. I like to joke that it was my car. <laughs> it's as expensive as a car. It's exp as expensive as a car. <laughs> yes. Wow, and it's probably easier to steal than a car, right? So, well, a lot of people... Take care of it. <laughs> A lot of people don't don't no. don't see the value in it, so they don't know it's steel worthy. So don't oh, we just around the secret <laughs> on the French horn. Okay, everyone watching will not tell how valuable the French horn is. Wow. Um, I guess, I guess a lot of people just don't know where they're gonna sell it. So because we'll be watching you. Yeah, the French horn community. <laughs> we know where. Who can buy it? They will know. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. uh, so the next, um, uh, we'll just do a couple duets out of, um, I don't even know how to pronounce, it, pronounce his name, uh, Terschnitt? I think it's German. So any German people, T-U-R-R-S-C-H-M-I-E-D-T. -E I didn't do my homework. If this was an actual performance, I would be doing my homework and asking German people how to pronounce the name, but. <laughs> um, I'm sure they will forgive you. Uh, so the first duet is uh, number two, duet number two, um, um, Minuetto. Thank you. 
did not have my piece that I was going to play off of. I had some markings in there. I guess you should never apologize when you're doing a performance. You are supposed to always act like, oh yeah, that was that was well, meant it, to like, happen. <laughs> frankly, it sounds amazing to me, and I know you did anything wrong, so all good. That was my point. Yes. So I think this is our last piece. Today. Yeah. So this is our last um, big finale. Yeah, our big Ooh, finale there. duet. <laughs> yes. It, yes, it actually is called fanfare. Uh, it's, fanfare, it's, perfect. <laughs> it's the Duo number uh, 11 um, by the uh, Tershmeet, ter 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 <laughs> <laughs> however you pronounce his name. Somebody will have to give us pointers afterwards. <laughs> We also have this big bell on the end uh, as well. And we do tune our instruments um, uh, like how guitar players or, or violinists, if you've ever seen them tuning their instruments, we also do tune our instruments. We do have slides in our horn that pop out like that. So um, our main tuning slides are at the back here. So we will adjust these to help make us more in tune. Uh, we also have a special technique with our hand that we use to hold inside our bell. So if you're playing with it on your knee, you'll have it a certain way. Or if you're playing with it off your lap, you'll have it in a certain way. And we also tune our instruments by adjusting our hand as well. In fact, before valves, that's how people were able to change their pitch in the instrument was by adjusting the position of their horn. Um, and we also use our embouchure to... Um, uh, to tune our instrument as well. So that's uh, um, that's how we produce sound on, on our instruments is through our mouthpiece with buzzing. Uh, so that's, um, and then you add it onto the instrument, it produces a lovely sound. Um, and we also tune by adjusting our embouchure um, as well. So that is... Um, so you have to have strong lips. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Lots of kissing to help yeah. with this practice. Well, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. And I was just going to say, too, to make us seem even better, the French horn is considered a very difficult instrument mm -hmm. because of the way you have to buzz and make that noise to make a sound. It can be very frustrating for play players that are just learning to make a note. It takes a lot of practice even to make a noise on this thing. Um, and that all brass instruments are kind of tricky and it's good to be naturally musical or a singer because you have to hear the note in your head before you make it on the instrument. So a horn joke to end today is... Horn joke, awesome! Um, man or woman blows into horn and only God knows what comes out of it because you could make a, a whole bunch, at least 10, 15 notes, depending on how you blow in each valve. So you have to know what you're going to sound like before you blow air through the instrument. So that's what makes it so difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Crazy. And I guess you could think by kissing a lot, it strengthens your lips, but I think it uses different muscles. <laughs> All right, maybe kissing. the French horn is not for me then. <laughs> well, thank you ladies so much for being here. Melissa and Kim, you guys are amazing. And I am, I am inspired. I am inspired. So yay, thanks for being here for 80 Days of Writing. We'll catch you next time. Hi, Alexis Marie Chute here again. Wasn't that horn playing amazing? Oh my gosh, so amazing. I'm so grateful that Melissa and her pal were here and that they played so amazing. Uh, anyway, I wanna say it is almost Mother's Day. So I have a very special book box compiled for moms to spoil, delight, and encourage self-care. So it has my book, Expecting Sunshine, A Journey of Grief, Healing, and Pregnancy After Loss. It is a story any mom, any parent can easily relate to. It is not a downer. It is a journey of joy. So this book is in the book box. There is a candle, treats, a door hanger that says, do not disturb, I'm reading. There is a special recipe for, for pina colada pancakes. Like, it is amazing. And there's so many little treats and goodies, an original one of a kind bookmark. So I really do wanna just give like a tiny little plug to say, please check out this book box as a gift for mom. Order soon so it makes sh you make sure it arrives on time. And thank you so much. Make sure you take care of your mom as she deserves it. All right, take care.